Um, so now I would like to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Jazz McKinney is a black indigenous two-spirit individual that although born and raised in Detroit has made West Michigan their home. Jazz has been involved in the mental health field for over 10 years and with racial justice work as well as advocacy and activism in the two-spirit lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer plus community for over 18 years, committing themselves to highlighting the importance of education, awareness, and involvement to create change. They are passionate about working to decolonize gender roles and identities, as well as discussing the impact that harmful gender binaries can cause within our communities. They currently serve as co-owner and lead trainer of Paradigm Shifts Consulting and the executive director of the Grand Rapids Pride Center. Without further ado, I represent Complex and Vexed, celebrating Afro-indigeneity as a queer two-spirit person by Jazz McKinney. All right, can y'all hear me? All right. How are y'all doing today? Good, good. Hey, out there in virtual space. Trying to make sure my computer wakes up, so I'm just talking because my computer is like, eh, I'm not plugged in. I wake up when I feel like it. All right. Buju, Jazz McKinney and Dishnikaz, Anishinaabe Indau, Nishmani Duak Indau, Wabuyatanang Nadoshbia, Awashtanang Indayin. I said, Greetings. My name is Jazz McKinney. I am a Black, Indigenous, Two Spirit individual. I'm originally from Detroit and currently live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and I am very honored to be here and have this opportunity to give the keynote address today. Um, when I was first asked to give this speech, at first it was uh, like, I was blown away. And then I was kind of like, no, you're kidding. Like, whatever, right? Like, um, but then I was kind of like, what? Like, what do I have to offer? What? Like, how do I even put into words who I am, um, right? Because Aaron's like, just talk about who you are. And I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> that's a lot. So how do I put that into words? Um, what I've gone through, who I am, how I identify, kind of on that journey of how I even got to that point of how I identify. Um, are there life lessons in there that maybe I can impart upon people and then most importantly to me, how can I make sure that I am honoring my ancestors um, in this process? So as Aaron and I discussed what we wanted folks to get out of this, um, we kind of talked about, um, you know, like the thinking space, the feeling space, kind of like Kim said, the co-creation, um, learning. So I'll kind of read the summary of what Aaron gave me and kind of what my process was. So um, a growing emphasis on DEI has increased the visual representation of historically underserved and underrepresented communities on our campus. However, when we focus solely on visual representations of diversity, we miss out on the stories that serve as the foundation for the true diversity that we all bring. So this lecture series that I get to lead off, hopefully, um, not hopefully, I am, um, but this lecture series that I get to lead is to grapple with where our identities meet each other and what does that really mean? So my goal today is to accomplish just that. Whether you identify as I do or not is not really the point but rather the understanding of how folks with multiple identities, especially multiple marginalized or historically underrepresented identities have to navigate through our world that tends to focus on a very single lens approach. So instead of understanding that humans are holistic, we are a multitudity of identities and no one will ever be able to define no one and no one identity will ever be able to define who I am. So as I speak, I will let you know some of my definitions of my identities um, so that you kind of know how I approach it um, because I do believe all identities also have nuances. So my experience and my definition of what it means to be black, for example, 
It may be different than someone else who is black and that's okay, right? That's the beauty of it. That's the joy of it. So who am I? Okay. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey with me. Okay. So go with me here. So I grew up in Detroit, as I said, right? Um, I've always been somebody that bucks the trend. Um, and you know, as frustrating as it was sometimes for my mom, um, she eventually was like, yep, that's my kid. I taught you to, hi baby. I taught you to do that. And I in turn am teaching my children that are going to be very loud today. (laughs) Hi. So that's me as a kid already, right? Super woman, super girl, super boy, whatever. I didn't really care, but I just knew I was super. Okay. Um, Also looking just like those over there. (laughs) Um, And this is the house that I grew up in. Um, So my grandmother actually still lives there to this day. She's owned that house now for like 50 years. So, Um, I grew up here with my grandmother, my mother, my uncle, his daughter, as well as myself. Um, so we grew up in a pretty nuclear, like our nuclear family was kind of what you see in a lot of, uh, communities of color by having multiple generations in one household. Um, so I was able to experience that, um, I think we finally moved out in middle school. So a lot of my formative years were spent having that nucleus, nucleus. And then that's my eight-year-old over there doing stuff that eight-year-olds do. do. Um, So one of the things that um, I think about when I think about how I grew up, my identity, who I am, all of that stuff is, I got to grow up in Detroit, the uh, home of Motown, okay? So music is everything to me. Um, I am also a musician myself, um, but music is everything. So I got to be listening, grow up listening to Motown, Stevie Wonder, um, you know, Smokey Robinson, Anita Baker, um, Diana Ross, right? All of these people, um, the temptations, um, my grandparent actually knew and grew up with the temptations. And my grandmother, who you see in this picture here, actually went to school with Stevie Wonder. So, they were very important to our lives, right? So, um, yes, <laughs> we got to know a bunch of folks and, and get to enjoy that, right? But then also Detroit has a very large jazz festival and I love jazz music, not ironically. <laughs> um, it, we also have an electronic festival. So Detroit also is the home of a lot of house music and techno music. Um, A lot of famous house and techno artists actually were born and raised in Detroit. Um, So music is is life and all sorts of music, right? R&B, you know, I listen to anything that suits my mood in the moment, right? Like I don't really care about genre. I listen to anything, okay? Um, And I also got to experience, you know, black culture because most of the folks on my street were black. I remember the day a white person moved in and it was like, you should have seen it. It was like a movie theater. Like all of us neighbors are like, you know, (laughs) casually, you know, walking dogs we didn't even have. We're just, you know, trying to see who's, you know, who's moving in. Um, And uh, (laughs) so I grew up around a lot of diversity But it was like being able to experience that. I grew up around black folks, Mexican folks, um, Caribbean folks, like all sorts of folks. Also, in case you don't know, Detroit, i.e. Dearborn, is the largest, is the place where the largest amount of um, Middle Eastern folks live. Um, And so I got to know a lot of their culture as well. 
Um, we, they have a lot of Chaldeans in that area. And if you don't know the difference, Chaldeans are Christian, Arabs are more Muslim. So um, both Middle Eastern, but Chaldeans are Christian. So, uh, you know, like there was so much diversity, it was great, okay? Um, but one of the things about it, come on computer, don't do this to me today, um, was because it was so heavy focus on black culture, Afrocentric culture, um, like I even went to an Afrocentric elementary school. This is my graduation picture from my elementary school. Um, and so it was very heavily black focused. Like I even learned Swahili, okay? That's how Afrocentric, we had to start and end our day at school saying prayers in Swahili, okay? We had to address our teachers in Swahili. If we did not, they didn't respond. They're, Oh, you want something? Oh, what, what do you need to say? Oh, okay, oh, right? But as any of you, if you know languages, if you don't speak it, guess what happens to it? Now, of course, as an adult, I wish I still knew Swahili because that's really cool and that's part of my heritage. But unfortunately, after I left this school, I was not, um, I didn't have a lot of folks that I could continue that conversation with. So, as I think about that, what came up for me was some of my um, unconscious biases that I learned growing up in this type of environment. And that was, it was very heavily focused on being proud of your culture, but not mixing it with other cultures, okay? So I grew up, especially as someone who is more light-skinned, having to deal with a lot of colorism, okay? So I heard a lot of times, you're not really black, you're not black enough, right? Like, who are you really mixed with? Oh, you must be one of those white people, right? Just trying to get whatever. So a lot of those things growing up had an effect on me, right? So I was going to prove how black I was, which meant sometimes I did black stereotypes because that's what I thought being black was, right? So I would purposely, I don't know, sag my pants or, um, you know, I might listen to jazz in the house, but as soon as I got outside, I was blaring my rap, right? you know, driving with the windows down, you know, right, I'm black, right? Which of course, as I think about it now, I'm like, what the, the come on y'all, like that was pointless. So let me back up though. Let me actually define colorism for you in case you don't know what that means. So when I talk about colorism, I talk about the discrimination against those with darker complexions which comes out of the legacy of slavery and colonization. So part of that is white supremacy has imposed Eurocentric beauty standards, declaring that those with lighter skin and looser hair textures are more attractive and more acceptable to society. So this came from Family Guy and he got pulled over and this is their color card. So it was kind of playing on like, oh, if you get pulled over by police, they use this card to see if you should be discriminated. But essentially this is colorism. So it was saying if you're a certain tone, right, you're okay. But if you're darker, the darker you get, you're not okay. Okay, so that's colorism. And that is rooted in white supremacy. Because then, this also is why I couldn't say that I was native. Because there was a lot of um, prejudices and biases based off of that because in our minds and what we saw and what people show us, native folks are light-skinned. And so what we saw in those native folks in uh, the Detroit area were more light skinned, 
right? That's why I'm more light skin because of the heritage and my ancestors. It is what it is, right? Like it's beautiful, but that's why I'm more light skin because of my native heritage. Now, I will say I probably also am more light skin because I am also the direct descendant of slaves. And a lot of my ancestors were raped by their white masters. And so that happens. So here you are. This is what you get. So when we're talking about that, it was a catch 22. It was, I want to acknowledge who I am. I want to be able to be who I am. However, in acknowledging that, I have to acknowledge that there may be some history and some ancestors that I might necessarily not be proud of, right? But I can tell you for sure, I am direct descendants of both native folks and black slaves, native slaves and black slaves. I also, because I have native on all sides of my family too, right? So I'm not just like one tribe. I'm a mutiny of tribes in there. <laughs> so I also have some native folks, um, native ancestors that were probably slave owners. So my family still owns land in the South, which lets me know that there were slave owners and not slaves themselves. So either way, so when I'm growing up and I'm just like, I know this history, I love this history, there's always something that resonated with me with my native indigenous history as well, but I was never able to um, acknowledge it um, externally, of course. My family, I knew they taught me, right? But externally, we were never able to um, talk about it because there's also discrimination even within the black community of um, you can't be half black. You have to just be black. If you're gonna be black, you're gonna be black, right? So who has heard of the one drop rule? So for those of you who haven't, essentially what the one drop rule means um, is, I guess it's a cute picture, we'll go back to it. Um, <laughs> but the one drop rule means no matter what race you are, as soon as you have one drop of black blood in you, you are now considered black. Okay, so for example, let's think about um, Halle Berry, a famous actress, okay? Now Halle Berry is 50-50, her, I can't remember, I think it's her mom that's white and her dad that's black, I don't know, not my family. Um, but either way, she's 50-50, one parent's white, one parent's black, okay? And so she's considered a black actress, right? Nobody calls Halle Berry a mixed actress or a white actress. She's just a black actress. Now then what happened is she had a child and she had that child with a white man. So her child, beautiful baby, well, she's not a baby anymore, but beautiful child, 75% white. But because of the one drop rule, people still call Halle Berry's child black. Now, she's part black, yes. The issue I'm bringing up is why can't she be both white and black? Because that's what she is. Why can't we acknowledge the beautiful um, intersections of all of our ancestors, right? Because I don't want to have to deny one side of my ancestors and, and, and boost up another, right? That doesn't feel right to me. Um, however, when we're talking about other people, they choose which side you are, right? So I have a friend that's also black and native, but they are uh, darker. So they are more in the mocha color, if you will. And so they definitely don't get to be native. People are like, I don't see it. What do, you, what do you mean you're also native? I don't see it. You, you're just black, right? But then when we're also talking about especially split focus, 
right? Like he talks about how he experiences life as a quote, black man, because if he's walking down the street, nobody stops and asks, Hey, do you have other, you know, races or ethnicities? Um, you know, that's a part of you as well, or are you just a black man? Right. Nobody stops and asks that. And so he was talking about this one time that he was being harassed and he was being harassed as a black man. Right. Like I'm of course not that he was being harassing. He's like, no, but I'm native too. Don't harass me. Right. Like you shouldn't be harassing people, period. Right. But essentially he was seen as a black man. When I was growing up, I remember being in high school, especially And me being like, but I'm, but I'm native, right? Like I I have this tribe and I have this tribe and I have this tribe. Like I'm, I'm like a lot of native too, right? Like not just like one, but I'm a lot of native. And, and it was like, no, you're not, you're not native. You're lying. And I'm like, well, how do you know? You don't know my family. But when I was growing up, the biggest thing was you couldn't be black and native because if you were, you were just trying to co-op the struggle and you were just trying to get free education. Because if you are, quote, 1 16th Indian, you can get free education. 1 16th or more. And so that's why people thought, especially in high school, right? Like I'm getting ready for college and things like that. That's why people thought that I was all of a sudden native, but I was always native. I just never felt safe enough that I could talk about it. But when I did feel safe enough, I was harassed and called a liar because I just wanted a free education. So speaking of being native, what is a two spirit person? So I said I was two spirit, right? And, um, Let me stop so I can define that for you because it is a very complex term. Go to that one. Yeah, there we go. So this is kind of like a a two-spirit pride flag, if you will. Um, An artist illustration of a flag anyway. Um, But a two-spirit person is essentially someone who does have native or indigenous you know, blood, culture, all of those things. And it's when you have, so being a native person, we believe a lot in like energy and spirits, um, the creator, that sort of thing. So a two spirit person um, is of the belief that they have a delicate balance of both feminine energy as well as masculine energy. So sometimes we believe that maybe if you are um, not two spirit, everybody still has um, you know all the energy. However, you may have like a dominant energy, if you will. A two spirit person has a good delicate balance, but it's not just oh, okay. You have the energy of a masculine, feminine spirit, right? But The two spirit people and two spirit is a pan native term, just so you know, which means that that term was created in the 90s to kind of help talk about um, this term that we always knew was there. And most indigenous cultures had more than two genders. And it wasn't until colonization that those genders started to disappear. And that was because as two-spirit folk, we were seen as spiritual leaders. We were seen as marriage counselors. If you know um, anything about native culture, um, a lot of two-spirit folks were the ones that was naming the children, which is a very high honor. Um, We could take both roles, hunter and gatherer, right? Like it just, there was such fluidity in indigenous culture that it was, it just was, right? It wasn't, this person wasn't like an anomaly. It just was. And it wasn't until colonization that the settlers started to see that they had this spiritual leader and the best way to break a culture and the best way to break, um, you know, folks 
is to kill their spiritual leader. So what happened is during colonization, they started killing off two spirit folk and native culture started to hide these folks and stop calling them two spirit, if you will, to try to save them. But because native culture is such an oral tradition, Throughout the generations, they started to forget that these people existed and take on the colonized mindset of only two genders. So this is something that was always there. But in the 90s, a bunch of two-spirit folks got together and said, you know what, we need to reclaim this. Like, we didn't go anywhere. You know, we might have changed our name, we might have changed like how visible we were, but we didn't go anywhere. So thus the term two-spirit was created. Um, so it's not as simple as, oh, I'm native and I'm LGBTQ, therefore I'm two spirit. That's not, that's not what it is. Now, yes, a lot of two spirit folks are LGBTQ, but that's not like a requirement. <clears throat> All right. So as I talk about being black, and being native, the one thing I haven't talked about yet was being queer. Um, at the time, I identified as a lesbian because that's the term that I knew and that's the term that you know, I was taught for kind of how I felt. Um, but for me, it was even harder having to deal with all of these uh, dualities of um, experiences because of colonization and because of um, religious stuff, um, being queer, being gay, was not nearly as acceptable as it was today when I was growing up. Um, and it was seen as an abomination. Um, when I came out, I had the Bible, you know, like, it was like cracked open right there, right? And just like, this is why you're going to hell. This is why you're going to hell. This is why you're going to hell. And so I hid it for a long time because I knew this, right? I, I hear other people talking about this. It wasn't necessarily towards me toward, for a long time because I wasn't out, but I would hear it, right? So, um, I knew and I started having those feelings when I was about five or six. I didn't come out until I was 15. So I had about 10 years where I hid this part of my identity. So I had to hide being native and I had to hide being queer. And I had to try to be the blackest black black person I could be because that's how I was trying to get people to accept me. Because most humans want to be accepted. Right. We can talk now, especially as adults. Oh, I don't need nobody. Right. Like I'm me. I'm a be me. Um, but especially as teenagers, like, yeah, we might say that, but we don't believe it. Teenagers need humans need to have human interaction. Right. So I was trying to do whatever I could to not take away that human interaction because I knew by coming out as coming out as native, there were folks that didn't believe I was and called me a liar by coming out as, um, you know, a lesbian at the time, you know, that was a whole nother thing. Right. And so all of that duality was going on. So, um, where some of this came from though, right? Like it wasn't just some random kids that was like, you know what, we're gonna hate on natives, right? It wasn't there. But <clears throat> this country is built on systems propped up by sexism, excuse me, racism, white privilege, all of those things. Um, and so um, being able to grow up as a black indigenous queer person, um, but not being able to be out about being black indigenous a queer person was very hard. So I'm gonna read to you though, a piece of where some of this came from. So most of you are aware of the Declaration of Independence, correct? So 
folks love to use the Declaration of Independence as a reason or a document to justify hate. Because in the document it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Right, and so when you see people say like, oh, we the people, right? That's what they mean. They're referring to the fact that this document that was created says all men are created equal, okay? But I submit to you that that's a damn lie because think about when that document was created. That document was created when black men were still considered three-fifths property they weren't considered men at all. So we're missing something. And what most people don't know is I'm actually going to keep reading. So then it says right after that, and I quote, merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So you'll tell me if that means that Native people are also created equally in that. Because in that document, that same document, you can go look it up, I'm not lying. It literally says all men are created equal, but it doesn't mention black men at all, doesn't mention women at all, and then it proceeds in the same document to call native people merciless savages. So that's where a lot of this hate is coming from. So it wasn't just, again, just random black kids that decided, oh, we're going to just hate on Indians. This country loves to put people of color against each other to further white supremacy. So it's not just, oh, black kids did it or whatever, because in native culture, they also have been taught this through boarding schools, residential schools, right? The stripping of native culture, all of those things as well. So as I talk about though, when we talk about like, where did black native people come from? It's a few things in there because in shared slavery, there was enslaved Africans as well as enslaved Native Americans. So in our history, a lot of times folks forget to mention that natives were also kept as slaves. And so we love to talk about enslaved Africans, which obviously very true. But we don't talk about the fact that besides the genocide that was happening for natives, they also kept natives as slaves. And so a lot of times enslaved Africans and enslaved Native Americans would marry with one another. They're on the same plantation, they would marry, they would have children. However, because slaves were not considered to be legitimate, These relationships, these marriages were not considered legitimate by law. Therefore, their children were not considered legitimate by law. Okay. Um, And then, of course, like I said, there are also Native individuals who did own African slaves and reproduce with them as well. But when we had the Indian Removal Act of 1830, Thousands of African Americans, whether enslaved or free, voluntarily traveled west with their native counterparts along the Trail of Tears, okay? But unfortunately, because a lot of black Native Americans often lack proper documentation, this resulted in a lot of unclear ancestral origins. And because even more so of colonization, right, the Dawes Roll was created. So the Dawes Roll is a segregated list which is kind of a census um, specifically for Cherokee Indians that in order to get on this list, they separated it by blood and by freedmen. 
So with this list being pretty incomprehensible to begin with, tons of people were left off of this list. And so now fast forward to today, if I wanted to try to recognize my Cherokee um, heritage, I would have to give them the name of my ancestor that I know is a Cherokee descendant. They would compare that name on this doll's roll and then they would say, sorry, that person doesn't exist. Therefore, you're not Cherokee. And even more so, they will kick, they kick, the Cherokee Nation kicks a lot of black people off of this list for said reason, because they can't find their ancestors, so therefore they don't exist. So this is why a lot of times you hear when folks are talking about it, like, and then they also created blood quantum. So blood quantum is how much native blood do you have in your system? And that classifies you as native. And so as I talked about that blood quantum earlier for getting that quote free education, essentially they use that um, 16%. You have to have 16% of certain blood in your system to qualify to be native. So that also is a white supremacist colonized term and creation of blood quantum. Because what that did, if you know anything about genealogy, is you get 50% of your genes from your mother and 50% of your genes from your father. So if your mother is, let's say, 25% Cherokee, mixes with 0% Cherokee from your father, guess what? Now you don't qualify because now you're only 13% Cherokee. So to wrap this up a little bit, so we need to be talking about the intersections of these identity uh, identities in this space, right? We need to be talking about queer justice is black justice. Because guess what? I can't separate my identities. As a queer person, I fight for black rights because I'm also black. And there are queer people in the black community, correct? As there are black people in the queer community, naturally. But I also fight for native rights because guess what? I'm also native. And so I'm a queer person in the native community, thus also native folks in the queer community. So instead of fighting against each other, we need to be supporting each other against the fight against white supremacy. Because the reason why all of these things were created was to keep us fighting so that white supremacy thrives. Because as soon as we stop fighting each other and actually think about trying to get rid of some of these segregated laws and these racist laws and these racist policies or these homophobic policies, transphobic policies, that's what white supremacy is scared of. Because they know that especially in this country, quote, minorities outnumber white folks. But they want us to continue fighting each other while they thrive. Now, of course, I'm not painting white people with a paintbrush, right? There are plenty of white people that are in the cause too, right? Because again, there are white people who are queer. And so fighting for queer justice too, right? And vice versa. So I'm not saying every single person. I'm talking about the structure. I'm talking about the system of racism, the system of homophobia and sexism and transphobia, right? I'm talking about white supremacy as a system. So we must create, because it's all connected. Yes, there we go. 
Um, so this says like racism, white supremacy, capitalism, individual over community, environmental terrorism, uh, man destroys nature, settler colon colonialism, misogyny, patriarchy, toxic masculinity. They're all connected, which of course leads to violence. <laughs> My computer, come on. All right. So we need to create spaces that recognize and celebrate black indigenous people, especially people who are making great contributions to both communities. We shouldn't be putting people in boxes. People should be proud of who you are, be strong in who you are, celebrate who you are, right? And remember that you are enough. You don't have to prove to anyone who you are, what you are, anything like that. You are enough. Because we need to do more research. We need to have more conversations about these issues. We need to have more justice around these issues, right? We need to be able to talk about these issues out loud so that we can er erase the stigma, the fear, the misinformation around these things. Because when you look at me, when you see me, you see a reflection of all of my ancestors. You see a reflection of my black ancestors. You see a reflection of my native ancestors. You see a reflection of my white ancestors, right? You see a reflection of me and my upbringing and it has created this person that you see here today. And so my job is to continue to celebrate myself especially for my ancestors who never got the opportunity to. And I thank you. And I'll leave you here with this quote is, if you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how amazing you can be. Maya Angelou. So she said it. <laughs> Jazz, thank you so much for your words, for your story, for your wisdom. We definitely appreciate it. I realize we started 10 minutes late, but I also wanted to acknowledge the room and still give time and space for questions. So I will open the floor. And I'm going to come to you with a mic because we're streaming. <laughs> Thank you, Jazz. Uh, that was a really informative and really personal presentation. So I appreciate you showing up today and sharing your truth, sharing your story with all of us. I wonder, you know, we're sitting in uh, the campus of a college community, um, more progressed learners, people in the community, you know, this whole city interacting with each other. When we think of younger education, primary, secondary education, when you talk about these things about celebrating identities, um, this month and all year round, what are some things that teachers, staff, students, um, that kind of educational community can be doing to uplift these stories and identities of our younger learners? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think the key word in there is education, right? Because in order for me to get to a point where I could celebrate all of my identities, I had to do education to combat the negative things that I was told about who I was or supposedly who I was. And so that's where it starts though. I would have loved to have a teacher teach me about powwows. I didn't learn about powwows until I was in my thirties, twenties, eh, <laughs> right? But if I had a teacher, even just tell me about it, right? That would have opened up a world of things. And so being able to celebrate that side of myself and understand the importance of it. And I think also shutting down ignorance and purpose th purposeful, hateful things that we know are just that, right? Like it's 2023, we shouldn't still be talking about Indian savages, right? Or uh, black people as thugs or, you know, uh, pedophile queer people, right? Like those have all been proven untrue time and time and time again. We shouldn't be allowing those narratives to continue. Other questions? Anything from our YouTube audience? No? Okay. Hi, 
I was gonna say, I have some written, we yeah. can keep going, <laughs> but there you go. Thank you, that was so beautiful, you sharing your story. Um, my question is, if somebody could have told Little Jazz about, well, let me think, I'm thinking my question as I'm talking about, yep. you talked about acceptance, which I think is such an important thing to um, focus on, especially when we're in these spaces where there's a lot of people coming with a lot of different identities. What do you wish somebody would have told Little Jazz about showing up and being accepted versus showing up and having to assimilate to something that doesn't feel mm -hmm. like you? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, actually, I think your question is the answer. I wish somebody told me I didn't have to assimilate. I wish somebody told me, like, my great grandmother um, would always tell me that I was special and never let anyone tell me any differently. But that was just one person, right? Like, not that I didn't believe her, right? That That is my, like, she's probably with me right now, right? Like, that is my baby. But I just wish that it was more than just my great grandmother, right? Because then little jazz kind of blew some of that off as, oh, you're my great grandmother. Of course, you're telling me that. Of course, I'm special to you, right? Like, you know, and of course, I was blessed with a very loving family. I also understand a lot of people don't get that either. But like, it still turned in my head to, yeah, you're my great grandmother. Like, you're not going to say I'm not special, right? <laughs> like, so I just wish it was more people and I had a community of support and being able to learn more. So like with my kids, I try to um, take them to cultural events, right? They come with me, obviously they're here, right? They come with me to events so they can learn and grow as well, whatever is age appropriate for them. But in getting them in the, excuse me, getting them in and letting them see differences and talk to different people and letting them figure out who they are as well without me imposing my views on them. Hey, Twin. Hey, um, Twin. Great presentation. Um, I was wondering, you talked a little bit about um, not defending your identities or how to not, and you don't have to, um, to some folks. And I was wondering, when those folks are parents who have questions or concern or don't understand, mm -hmm. or they're your siblings or your friends, or um, how do you stand by your identities, not have to defend yourself, and still maintain healthy relationships? Mm -hmm. um, I know, right? <laughs> um, all right, and part two of the series is <laughs> Allie's questions. Um, but... I mean, it's hard. It really is. For me, it, it, it is taken having actual friends, right? Friends that do accept me um, because I also had to change my definition of who a friend was or who family was. And unfortunately, yes, that means I had to cut off some folks that like I really didn't want to cut off. But if they're not benefiting me, if they're not you know, boosting me up to be who I want to be and they're continuing to put, but, but what about this? But what about that? You know, like then you're not for me. And unfortunately blood, no blood, whatever that means. Like I don't talk to my father because he has this notion in his head of who I am and that's not it. And unfortunately that means that I had to cut him off. Right. So I think it's it's dual focus of working on yourself to get to the point where you accept yourself. And once you know who you are, at least the core of who you are, right? You're always gonna be learning and growing and changing. But once you know the core of who you are, anybody who doesn't like it can kick rocks. I'm gonna go to the, I'll come to you first and then we will take the last question. That's a good speech, uh, being mixed. I think it really correlates with me. And I wanna ask, you talk about two-spirited and um, uh, these people essentially claiming uh, that word back or um, that term back. Mm -hmm. I wanna ask your take on 
uh, being mixed terms like mulatto or light skin and uh, what kind of impact that can have on, uh, you know, this change in accepting of kind of integration. Mm-hmm. Uh, could, I, I don't know. I, I feel like my views on it may be a little mixed. Uh, just people, uh, some of the light skins say that uh, are claiming the word may not be claiming it for the right reasons necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I just wanted to ask your take on terms like that. Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. I'm a big believer in you have to identify with whatever term people use for you. So if you are somebody that doesn't identify as mulatto or you know queer or anything like that, then that term is not for you because nobody gets to tell you who you are, right? However, there is still that um, notion of reclaiming terms, right? Like I use the word queer. 20 years ago, people would have been throwing stones at my head for using that word because it was such a negative term because people used to get beaten with that word. And, you know, so um, it's kind of like the debate about the N word, right? Like who gets to use it? Who doesn't? Should we use it? Should we not? Right. But it's one of those things where like, as long as you know what the term means for you and you are able to reclaim that for you, what that means. Cause sometimes reclaiming a term literally means kind of throw it into people's faces. I know you are trying to use that term in a negative light, but you can't hurt me. I'm gonna use it however I want to use it. Right. And so being able to identify with whatever term you want to use, if you want to identify with any term, right. You could just be like, call me by my name. I don't need none of them terms right? I am who I am. My name is Jazz. And that's how, that's how I identify, right? That's totally cool too. I went through that phase too. I'm Jazz. Literally my email, my first name is Just. My last name is Jazz. I am Just Jazz. That's who I am. I love that. As my hashtag is simply just J. There you on go. On social media. So Thank you for being here. Um, I'm the yin to the yang in the ODI office, um, Jamelia. So I wanted to first thank you um, for being transparent and showing up and being yourself um, in this space. And we've learned a lot and you shared a lot of things that incorporate you, your family, um, and all of those things that we can kind of take away from. So I have a two-parter to close us out, (laughs) Um, of course. Of course. So the first one is this idea of mentorship. And you shared a lot about your story in terms of you had to hide a lot, you had to um, pretend to be things that you naturally really wasn't, but you know, if it wasn't safe, you had to do what you had to do. Mm-hmm. So sure. were there mentors or people outside of your family or wasn't that wasn't mentioned in your presentation that helped you to shape some of your, your principles or your perspectives that guide you to, guided you to say, you know, forget this, I'm gonna be me, I'm gonna do do what I gotta do, I'm gonna be my true authentic self. And then the second part was that you also mentioned you celebrate you or you celebrate the identities that intersect within you. So if you could share some of the ways that you personally celebrate yourself, Mm -hmm. that may be takeaways for us who also may have intersecting identities. Sure, sure. As well. So the first question, I just threw that in my head here. Um, The first question is, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about my spouse. So me and my spouse celebrate our 20 year anniversary this year. So (laughs) thank you. Um, So they're probably back there with the baby or something hiding now that I said their name. But um, without my spouse, it definitely I would still be on a much longer journey because they were one of the main people that's just like, man, mm -hmm -hmm. blank, blank, blank. Right. (laughs) <laughs> and so, but besides my spouse, definitely finding other folks like me was super helpful. Um, so I had a lot of mentors when I came to college, I actually went to Grand Valley. Um, and so at Grand Valley, I purposely put myself in situations to find people like me, but also people who could celebrate me. So I have a mentor that like all of our identities are like over here, right? Like I'm black, she's white. Like I'm not a woman, she's a woman, right? Like just, right? Like I grew up poor, she didn't. Um, (laughs) And 
But she celebrated me at every turn, right? And she made sure that even when I had those days that I didn't want to celebrate me, she said, no, 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 what are we doing? What are we doing? We, no, that's not, that's not what we're doing, what we're about to do, right? And so having those folks in your corner, whether that's one person, whether that's 10 people, whether that's that person was only there for a year to get you on your next step of your journey. So I was even just talking about one person that really kind of helped me on my journey, my native journey a little bit too. I no longer talk to them. I met them, we talked, we had a good time. Two years later, we no longer speak. That was their role in my life. Right. And understanding, too, that not everybody is meant to be in your life forever. Right. There are some people that literally come in your life for a season and you need to accept that. Second question. Whoop. How do I celebrate me? I go to sleep. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I love sleep, but also spending time getting to know who I am, what I am and fostering things that I love. So. I love um, playing video games. So if I can play some video games, right? I love social justice. So there are times I'll, you know, you'll see me and, and, and talking about social justice, right? Doing things like this, like this fuels me, right? A lot of folks speaking is tiring, but for me, this fuels me, right? So being able to do things like this um, and being able to acknowledge that I also understand that I am a mentor to other folks. And so, yes, that comes with a little bit of pressure, (laughs) but it makes sure that I'm also on my toes, you know, because, and even when I'm not using that though, as opportunity to learn and grow, because I'm not a believer that you have to be a hundred percent every day. That's crap, (laughs) right? Like I may be 20% today, but guess what? You going to get my 20%. Right, because your best is your best, whatever that means for that day. So being able to do the things that I love, especially with the people that I love, is definitely how I continue to celebrate myself. Jazz, thank you for everything. Yes. Appreciate it. 